Well, hello and good morning, everyone. We were just having a little conversation about the weather that uh, seems like we're um, experiencing winter for a minute, once again, at least in Salt Lake City. And, uh, and I think that's okay, right? It's only February 16th. So um, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for joining us. And hopefully you're staying warm and dry wherever you are. Let's go to our next slide. So here's um, what our agenda is going to look like this morning. We'll start out with our introductions like we try and always do so that you guys can kind of know a little bit more about who, who else is in this world of care coordination with you. And if you feel like um, showing your face, we love that. Um, if you don't, that's not a problem, but it does help us to kind of, you know, figure out who is who. So, so feel free to do that, even if it's just for the introductions, if you want. And uh, we'll take a few minutes to do that. Then we'll go through some announcements and some updates. Um, we'll talk about uh, brainstorming uh, cases and any resources that you've come across, um, any updates to cases. We'd love to hear those. Uh, anything you're doing around motivational interviewing or quality improvement, we love to, to have you tell us what's going on there. Um, that's really your time and uh, we hope that you'll take advantage of that. And then after that, we're going to move into our uh, main portion of the meeting, which is all around autism. And we're delighted to have um, several folks come and tell us about some, some really important and interesting uh, information and resources today, including um, Colin Kingsbury, who actually wears many hats. Um, we've only put one of them here, and he's got a lot to tell us. Um, uh, and, and Colin, uh, we really appreciate Colin coming back pretty much every year lately to kind of keep us up to date with what he's doing around autism and, and what's happening in Utah. And then uh, Dr. Paul Carbone will come and talk to us for a few minutes about some of the things that are going on um, around autism in, in his programs, including a, an exciting uh, new ECHO series. And then Amalia, who I think you all know, will talk a little bit more in depth about the SPARC program, the fact that it's been actually going on for five years now. So pretty interested to, to hear more about that. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up and be done by 10. So um, we'll start with our introductions and I'll go first. So I'm Mindy Tuller and I am the Director of Operations for the Medical Home Portal, which we try and tell you about uh, every meeting. And I also facilitate this meeting and um, and love to have you all here. Um, let's see, Michelle, I'm just going to probably go down through the uh, the list of participants. And then if you'll kind of try and watch and prompt me for those that I missed, that would be great. But I see you next. So Michelle, do you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Yeah, I'll happy, happily help look for everybody. But yeah, I'm Michelle Redfield. I'm the administrative assistant for the medical home portal, UCCCN and uh, general pediatrics. Thank you, Michelle. We really appreciate all your help. And Amalia, I have you next on my list. Turn my camera on for that. I'm a project coordinator in pediatrics, specifically the UDAC clinic. I help with the Aspire project as well as the Spark for Autism study. Wonderful. And we'll hear from you later. <laughs> all right. And um, Tony, I see you next on my list. Hi, this is Tony. Um, I'm a care coordinator with the Integrated Services Program with Eric's team. We're so glad to have you. And Tony, you're typically in the uh, Ogden area, right? Yes. Okay, um, Athena, I see you next. Hi, Athena Parker. I'm with the Medical Home Portal team as well, and I'm the serv um, Support Services Manager. Great. All right, um, next I have Cassie Crane. Hi, I'm Kathy Crane. I'm a care coordinator for Wasatch Pediatric South Point. I'm really glad you could join us this morning, Cassie. Um, let's see, Colin, I show you up next. Hi, I'm Colin Kingsbury, and I'm with the Autism Systems Development Program at the Utah Department of Health. Great. All right. All right, Dora. Hello, I'm Dora. I'm the Professional Relations Coordinator for Shriners Children in Salt Lake City. Thank you. Always happy to have Shriners represented and to see Dora. All right, Eric, Eric Christensen, you're up next. Good morning, I'm Eric Christensen. I'm the program manager with the Integrated Services Program, the Bureau of Children with Special Healthcare Needs at the Utah Department of Health. Great, and next we have Evelyn Hernandez. Hi, 
Evelyn, if you are not able to, oh, she's got it in the chat. <laughs> My name is Evelyn. I am the care coordinator from Utah Valley Pediatrics, the Cherry Tree Office. Excellent. Glad to have you here, Evelyn. All right, Gwen, I see you next. Good morning. Um, I'm Gwen Anderson. I work on Eric's team with Integrated Services. I cover Carbon, Emory, and Grand Counties. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here, Gwen. Um, next, I see Heather Carlson. And you know, Heather, we're just so delighted to have you back on these. And Heather may not be able to talk. I see you, Heather. Are you able to introduce yourself? She's waving. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Heather's um, again part of the integrated services team. We're so happy that she's she's kind of back and and more in the mix. You're you're very valued, and it's just lovely to see you again. So <laughs> and we would never want any of you to think that your taxpayer dollars go to buy good technology that actually works. So <laughs> we're in the process of trying to get Heather a new computer. So sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. All right. Next, I'm seeing Ivana de Santiago. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Go ahead, Ivana. Maybe I muted myself again. Sorry, because I was talking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ivana de Santiago with University of Utah Health Funds and Healthy U Medicaid um, Nurse Care Manager. Wonderful. Oh, we're so glad to have you. Welcome, welcome. All right. And next, I see Jade Porter. Muted too. Hi, I'm Jade with also University of Utah Health Plans and Healthy U Medicaid and excited to have Ivana be here with us. Excellent. We're, we're really happy to have you both. That's great. It's nice to see you, Jade. Oh, and our meeting today starts at 930. So I, we won't be able to stay the whole time, but we're excited to be able to be here. That's great. Okay. Progress. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. And next up, I see Janet Espinoza, and you've already put your uh, information in the chat, Janet. So Janet's with Southwest Children's Clinic. And of course, we're delighted to have you guys on. Have you on? All right, up next, I see Laurel Bishop. I'm Laurel Bishop. I'm a URLN parent trainee, and I have four kids on the spectrum. Oh, we're happy you're with us today, Laurel. Always, we're happy when you join us, but this seems like it's a, a good meeting for you to be at. <laughs> Great. All right, um, next, I'm, I hope I won't um, get this name pronounced wrong. Is it Meyer Lohr? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Um, so my name is Mayur Lore. I work here at Help Me Grow Utah. Welcome. We're happy to have you here. Glad you could join us. All right, up next, I see Natalie Allen. Hi, my name is Natalie Allen, and I'm the nurse practitioner for Integrated Services Program. Um, everyone always says, you know, Eric's program. So at Department of Health, and I love these meetings. So thank you. Always, always so pleased when you're with us, Natalie. And I see another Natalie. So that is Natalie Carter. Natalie, if you're not able to um, introduce yourself, that is okay. If you have a chance to maybe put your information in the chat, that's always helpful, but that's okay. All right. Um, Rebecca Cialino. Sorry, it took me a second to get off on me. I'm Rebecca Cialino. I work for University of Utah and in the family practice, I'm a care manager. Oh, that's great. We're so happy to have someone here from family practice. Wonderful. Okay. And your name is really cool too. <laughs> um, Tina Purcells. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Purcells. I am uh, first and foremost a parent of a 22-year-old who has multiple diagnoses, including um, autism, pretty severe nonverbal autism. And um, I'm also a stay-at-home working mom 
who stays home with her isolated son. I'm also a parent consultant for the Utah Parent Center, um, Utah Family Project, Utah Family Voices Project with the Utah Parent Center. I've been there for 15 years. And I'm an author and reviewer for the Medical Home Portal. Yes, we rely on Tina heavily. She's just a fantastic resource. Glad you're here. All right, I'm noticing that Natalie Carter was able to put her uh, information in the chat. She's the um, care coordinator with the children who for, with special health care um, in central Utah. So Natalie, we're very pleased that you're, you're able to be with us. Excellent, okay. Um, Trisha Young, and Trisha also put her information in the chat. Um, she's with Wasatch Pediatrics Willow Creek location. Hi, Trisha. Happy you could join us. All right, Walt, I see you up next. All right, good morning. This is, I'm Walt uh, with Integrated Services Program, just part of the State Health Department and part of Eric's group. And I'm located uh, in Salt Lake City as a care coordinator. Glad you're with us, Walt, as always. All right, a couple more people have um, put information in the chat. So Lexi, Lexi is um, a transition specialist uh, working with uh, Eric's Integrated Services Program. Glad you could be with us this morning, Lexi. And um, Alicia Mather, nurse care manager for Memorial Pediatrics Clinic. Fantastic, welcome, welcome. And then I know there's a couple of other people who have joined. So I know that uh, Michelle will help me, but I'm gonna quickly look through, and I think I see Gabby. Good morning, uh, my name is Gabby Baragoshi. I'm one of the quality improvement specialists uh, at UPIC, and I am happy to be here. Glad to see you too, and I see Heidi as well. Heidi. Hey, oh, okay, let's see my, my, my video. There you go. So, hi, my name's Heidi. I'm also um, a quality improvement specialist with UPIC, and I work with Gabby and Amalia. Excellent, wonderful. All right, uh, Michelle, can you help me figure out who else I may have overlooked? Yeah, I've got Angie Richens. Oh, great. Hi, Angie. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Angie Richens. I am the Director of Behavioral Health and Case Management for Alpine Pediatrics in Utah County. Oh, we're glad you're here, Angie. Great. Okay. And I also see Haley Shumway. Mm -hmm. Haley, if you're not able to unmute, that's fine. If you have a chance to maybe put your information in the chat, that's cool, but I know that's not always available for everyone. All right, anyone else, Michelle? No, I think that is everybody. Terrific. Okay, and I will just take this moment to uh, let you know that you are always welcome to use the chat. Um, we have found that to be a really positive silver lining for uh, having to move to Zoom for these meetings. Um, it's a, a great way to sort of supplement and, and make sure that uh, you have a chance to ask questions or get more information uh, during the meeting. So please use it if you're able and if you want to. Great. Okay, well, let's um, keep moving. So we always encourage you to, uh, to use a, a computer if you're able, because I think the, the best experience for these meetings and more interactive is through uh, you know a fully functioning device, but um, you know, if you're waiting on a new computer like Heather, you do your best. And we'll try and end promptly at 10 a.m. and respect your time. Um, we just want to uh, remind you that we are um, doing a new Zoom registration. If you're on here, you figured it out. So I'm kind of, uh, this, is, this is kind of moot, but uh, we're doing that because um, it really helps us a lot to understand who's attending these meetings. Uh, when you register, you get a number of the meetings that'll pop up that you can put on your calendar, and please be sure and do that. And then it's um, just that much smoother to have you join us um, for those subsequent meetings. And we're also trying to publish our schedules in advance so that you have more of an understanding of, of what to expect, and that is on the um, Medical Home Portal on the UCCCN page. And that's what we've got here. I do need to update this just a little bit. I apologize I didn't get more on um, for this meeting. But next month, we're uh, excited about having a legislative session update. 
Our Project ECHO for pediatrics, it, our spring session is underway. We had a, a really great uh, meeting on the 2nd about medical neglect. And we have one, and one on the 9th about human trafficking. They're pretty uh, heavy subjects, but really, really important. And then the next one in our regular pediatric Project ECHO spring session is on March 2nd, and it's about foster care. And then as you'll hear a little bit more later uh, in our meeting, we also are doing a side-by-side -side, um, autism uh, echo series, and that's headed up by Dr. Paul Carbone and then a number of his colleagues, and you can see their names listed here. And the first one of those starts next Wednesday. And again, these are recorded, so if you're unable to make them at the noon time, uh, we understand completely, but if you are able to make them and you're interested, there is uh, nurse contact hours and um, continuing ed available. Um, just some quick updates, and I'm not actually going to pop out to the medical home portal and show you this uh, for the sake of time, but we have um, updated a number of our newborn disorder pages. You can see those listed here. We're going to be continuing to do this as part of a project um, that's in coordination with the American College of Medical Genetics. Um, and some of these, of course, are not necessarily genetic based, but many are. And so we're actually streamlining our format to make those um, less redundant, more user friendly, and to make sure that they are completely up to date. Okay, I'm going to turn the time over for just a second to Athena. Athena, I am going to stop sharing and see if you can um, pop on and talk for a minute about uh, stuff on the medical home portal. Okay, great. Is everybody seeing the autism? Okay, thanks. Great. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit of content on the medical home portal that relates to our presentations today, and then um, link you to a little bit of the resources in our directory, Utah directory as well. So we have a lot of great information about autism, one of which is a complete diagnosis module on autism spectrum disorder, and it goes through um, kind of everything at a, on a more um, a medical level, but really great information in here for all types of audiences. At the very bottom of this module, it links to services for patients and families. And you can see here we have different kinds of service providers that uh, families and or um, you as care coordinators or other medical professionals might need to re refer families to. And these link to our, right to our service directory. So here, if we take a look at, for example, the ABA category, you can see there's 45 providers listed for the state of Utah. If I click on that number, it's going to take me right to the directory. And here I, can, I get a nice map view of those service providers and uh, listings as well that you can expand um, and contract from here or click right on to to see more detailed information about the services that they offer. Um, in addition, in our for parents and families section, we have a, a frequently asked questions page on the autism spectrum disorder. And it walks through, again, some of these frequently asked questions that new families might have, new diagnoses, things like that. Again, just a reminder that these pages are all um, you're able to translate on the spot. So again, if you had a family, maybe that had a new diagnosis and spoke a different language, you could go ahead and put this page in that language for them, print it off, uh, right here's the print button, and, and, and that could be a really great resource um, for them if, if they're trying to learn more about a new diagnosis. How do I get back to English? So that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I thought that would be right at the top and easy to navigate. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, so again, some so another great content piece. And at the bottom of this frequently asked questions page, there's also a link to different resources as well that might be helpful for families and a similar type um, grid with the types of service providers that that those families might also be interested in. So within our um, service directory as well, we have a different, a couple of different ways you can search for uh, service providers. Again, 
you can do the term search, just search for autism. That's going to pull up all kinds of stuff. If I just type, start to type autism into our service categories, though, you can see there is one specific to autism programs. Or again, I can try to type, if I'm looking for ABA, um, I can see that that's going to come up as well. Search produces this nice list map view and a great way to narrow down services uh, by area. One final thing, this is a lot today. Uh, we, we have actually already generated a list, uh, a customized list. So again, this is if you create an account and sign in with the medical home portal, you'll have this list option up here where you can then create customized lists that you can print, you can share unique URLs for. So I've gone ahead and created one that includes all the ABA providers that are currently in our directory. And I'll go ahead and share this with you um, in the chat. And what you can do is then go to it and make a copy of it and customize it and tailor it for your own area. And it will save. And, and as, as listings get updated, if phone numbers change or web addresses change or addresses change, it would automatically update um, that list for you. So I'll, I'll pop that in the chat and, and hopefully that'll be a useful tool. Thank you, Athena. Really appreciate that. Okay, I'll go back to sharing. I think, great. All right, so brainstorming. Um, like I mentioned, this is your time. So hopefully some of you have some things you'd like to um, ask for help with or update us on or tell us about. Looks like I've got some, some things happening in the, oh, those are Athena's, great, thanks Athena. So you can use the chat um, if that's helpful to you um, or you can unmute and just start talking. And I'm gonna go ahead and mute and let you guys have this time. Hey, I'm going to start. This is Tina. Um, I don't have a lot of, well, I do need some brainstorming. Um, the first thing I want to do is show you a product that we have put out that is going to be available this week. Can I share really quick? Can somebody give me permission? It's, it's green, so I'm going to go ahead and try. Yeah, you should be able to. Wait a minute. Okay, so we have an outreach project with Utah Family Voices currently and um, for COVID-19 and we are developing, can you see the screen? We, we've developed this easy to read guide for, um, let me go down and read this language to you really quick. This easy to read COVID-19 materials were primarily developed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and others who read or listen with understanding below a third grade level. So our whole thought here is we're getting a lot of calls of parents who have maybe young adults with autism or um, they're just very aware that they do not wanna get this vaccination for one reason or the other. So we are, trying to put together some, you know, materials that families can read with their kids, give to their kids, um, and very simple, super easy to read guide. This is what easy to read looks like according to the CDC. And um, very simple, very easy to understand. Um, so we've got a couple of subjects. We've got the spread, we've got people with disabilities in COVID-19 things you have to know when you have COVID-19. And then of course, um, why the vaccines are important. Um, so that'll be available if anybody wants it, they can contact me or the parent center and just ask for it. It's in English and Spanish. The Spanish is exactly what you see in the English. Um, so wanted to let you know that's available. Okay, I'll stop sharing. And then also, um, I am looking for people right now. I'm currently, uh, Family Voices is currently talking with the Disability Law Center about 
the lack of adult services on the tech dependent waiver. For those of you who don't know, the tech dependent waiver is generally people, um, children and adults who are trait or on a trait event and on that, you know, living in the community. Um, I am trying to get down and stop sharing my screen, but it's not letting me. Hang on. It pops up usually. Um, and so I am currently looking for adults that are on the waiver. And um, so if you guys know any trait vented or trait or trait vented um, adults above 18, I would love to speak with them. Um, so you can put them in contact with me. We are looking to just get some, some voices together to talk about this subject. Tina, um, Amalia asked in the chat if law students would be able to help with this tech dependent waiver. Law students? Um, maybe in, in, in the future, I'll bring it up to the people I'm working with, but at this point right now, we're looking at just um, gathering information at this point. And so, um, but I will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. You know, I have a 17 year old trach patient who's, you know, looking at transition at this point. Would that be worthwhile for you? Yeah, if they're looking at transition right now, if they're close to 18, that's perfect too. I've got a couple of families as well that are going, what are we going to do? Um, Adam's 22 and he's still waiting. And um, we, there's just nothing. You know, it's it's definitely something that this that the disability law center is interested in looking at, and um, they do feel that we need to get some people together. So um, that'll be something that's ongoing. And and if you have anybody, please send them to me. It may give already them my, be somebody you know. Give them my parent center contact information. Great. Okay. And I'll put that in the chat for everybody too. Very good. Thank you, Tina. Thanks. All right, guys. So that's exactly what this brainstorming time is about. So anyone else? This is Gwen from Price. Um, I just got a new kiddo, so I don't know um, a, a whole lot about them. Um, we got him enrolled in Part B preschool. He's really a sensory seeker, probably on the spectrum, but that's not diagnosed. He has been prescribed, uh, I think, clonidine for sleeping. He's three. He is still not sleeping. and. Um, Mom has even uh, like posted on the local uh, mom's group on Facebook, like she does not know what to do. He got up at 4 a.m. this morning. They slept through it. He emptied everything in the house, um, the dog food, everything out of the refrigerator, <laughs> poured milk on the floor, and they are just exhausted trying to um, keep up with him and to get some rest themselves. They also have a one-year-old. How old again? Three. I think about three and a half. So some families I know, I, he's little. So, you know, you have to really be careful and consult with doctors about sleeping options that aren't, you know, that are med medical. But um, I do know some families that have actually put an alarm on the kid's door so that when they do try to, you know, wake up and go trash the kitchen, that they at least have a heads up that it's going to happen. There are some really cheap alarms. <laughs> they are at the dollar store. I actually used one when I had my, 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 when we brought my daughter in as a foster child because she always wanted to run away. So we put one on the back door and um, it worked. It worked. We had a very annoying loud alarm. Um, so they can be found in the like tool section or 
battery section of the dollar store. Thank you. I will make sure I mention that to mom. Okay. Hey, Gwen, it's uh, Paul Carbone from um, UDAC and the Child Development Program. Um, we would love to see the family. We can do telehealth visits so they don't need to drive up. And I think you know about us. So if, if that's something that could help sort of define the entire picture in terms of you think that there may be something on the order of autism, um, as well as, you know, we do ongoing management of co-occurring conditions in kids with disabilities as well. So sleep, sleep is something that we um, address um, every day of the week and Sunday. And um, lots of times it's a, a, you know, combination of things. So there may be some behavioral reasons why um, whatever, whatever is not causing sleep is being inadvertently reinforced or all kinds of, of reasons why kids may not sleep. And so we, we, we get lots of time in our appointments and we can, you know, troubleshoot with the family and potentially help with medications as well, if that's indicated. Perfect. I did send a referral on the 10th for him. So, um, he's on your wait list. So hopefully you'll be able to see him and help this little mama because she is exhausted. We would love to. And just to let you know, um, we have a new process in place based on feedback from families where when we do receive the referral, we send a text to the family letting them know that we received it and letting them know that we're going to give them a, a call as soon as um, we're ready to schedule. So hopefully they've gotten a text from us letting us letting them know that they've received the referral. If they haven't, you um, may want to check on that. I'm glad that you told me that. I have not had any families tell me that they received the text, but now I can ask about it. So um, that will be great. Thank you. Sure. Well, that's really good information. Thank you. Um, and I just popped uh, the Medical Home Portal's uh, behavioral techniques to improve sleep page on here as well. Um, we have a number of pages on sleep. Uh, interestingly enough, we have a, a pediatric echo coming up on sleep in March as well. Um, but until you're able to have the kiddo be seen by UDAC, Gwen, maybe um, this could be a little bit helpful as well. I think it will. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll make sure you get that, that link too. Oh. Okay, awesome. Sometimes I think we should just have a whole meeting doing this. I'm so sorry that we have to move on to um, uh, the main point of the meeting, because I love these, these uh, brainstorming op opportunities when we get to help connect people to resources. Um, and we would love to always have Dr. Carbone on these meetings as well. But we'll take you for whenever we can get you. If I'm invited, I'll come. Yeah. Okay, we'll invite you. <laughs> All right, well, I am very pleased now to um, turn the time to, uh, to Colin. Um, let me go ahead and pop to the next slide. And then Colin, you, um, you're going to want to share, right? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll let Colin um, share his screen and um, also introduce uh, himself a little bit better because he, as I mentioned, um, does a lot of stuff. Well, um, thank you all for having me. I very greatly appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate the we're using Zoom here because I have to use this in a meeting later today. So it's nice to reacquainted. Um, so I am Colin Kingsbury with the Autism Systems Development Program uh, in the Bureau of Children with Special Health Care Needs at the Utah Department of Health. Um, under that program, there's a bunch of other like little, little things, um, you know, one of which is the Utah Registry of Autism and Developmental Disabilities. And for that, I'm the Oversight Committee Chair and Data Steward. Um, in that, we work with very closely with the University of Utah Department of Psychiatry on the Utah Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. Um, we'll, I'll be sharing uh, some of their most recent data today. And then I'm also um, with the Adult Autism Treatment Account Program. Uh, that's a treatment account program that I'm not really gonna touch on today, but uh, as, as a brief uh, about that, um, it's, a la it's designed to um, pro provide funding for services for adults with significant or profound disabilities, um, you know, to do things that 
DSPD or Medicaid and stuff like that doesn't cover. Um, I think as we get into the more nitty gritty of my slides, we'll see why having funding to allow folks with autism, even if they are intellectually dis disabled, to be part of our community, to feel love, understanding, and all that is is very, very, very important. Um, so the mission of um, the Autism Systems Development Program as a whole is to reduce the age of diagnosis for children with autism. Um, we kind of feel like if you can get them in earlier, you can get them into services earlier, you'll have uh, better outcomes. Um, the mission of URAD and what URAD is, um, as I mentioned, it's a partnership um, with the University of Utah Department of Psychiatry. It's been measuring the prevalence of autism rates since 2002, um, so for a very long time. And off and on, it's been part of the um, CDC's ATOM network. Um, you'll know the ATOM network whenever you see um, uh, the new autism prevalence rates. It's, it's going to come from these folks. Um, and they do incredible work all throughout the country. And so you can compare um, Utah to Arizona to South Carolina to um, Tennessee and all those, those places. Um, okay, this is just kind of legalese. Um, as I mentioned, the prevalence rates. So in 2018 in Utah, prevalence rates were found to be 2.2%. So um, this is specific to eight-year-olds. So 2.2% of eight-year-olds in Utah um, have uh, had an autism diagnosis or an autism special education classification. Um, this is looking at Salt Lake, Davis, and Tooele counties, um, you know, which we feel is a good mix of uh, urban and, and uh, rural areas. Um, although, as the CDC always lets us know, they, they, they view Davis County as a rural uh, county as well, um, which is always kind of a, a shock you know, for those of us in Utah. Um, but, you know, you can see that these have gone up to 2.2%. You're probably looking at that 2008 number and you see it's 2.1%. Um, I always like to clarify for folks that that was looking at just Salt Lake County and just Salt Lake School District in Salt Lake County. So those numbers are a little, you know, the, the error brackets on that one would be a lot higher than these other ones. Um, here's how we compare to the rest of the country. Um, you know, in 2008, we had that, that big pop up, that big temple moment. Um, but after that, we've, we've remained pretty steady, um, and the rest of the country as a whole has gone up and kind of surpassed where we're at in Utah. Um, a, a reason for this happening was most uh, Adam sites in the past did not have access to special education records, so they missed a lot of kids, and now it's a requirement that you have to have access to those. So they've gone up as well. Um, so in looking at this data and looking at those kids and their characteristics, um, you know, we see by 54 months of age, uh, half of eight-year-olds with autism um, were, were diagnosed. Um, IQ data, 27% um, had intellectual disability. So, you know, you're looking at 73% did not. Um, and then for four-year-olds, we see that 30, or 59% um, had intellectual disability. So kind of what you're seeing there is that a four-year-old that presents with intellectual disability is going to get diagnosed earlier than an individual that is um, higher functioning or however you would, you would want to phrase that. Um, so you're, you're missing those, those folks. Um, they're getting diagnosed later and later. Um, you know, I, I didn't put this in here, but we have some 16 year old data showing that they're getting diagnosed as late as, you know, 16, 18, um, 20, uh, 70, some, sometimes 70 years old. I, I had a, a friend diagnose somebody with autism at 70. And I, I said, what, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're killing my uh, age of diagnosis right here. Um, so some takeaways from this, this report. Um, 
you know, the, the prevalence rate increased from 1.7 to 2.2 percent. Um, you know, it, the rates are higher in uh, white children than minorities, um, Latin, Hispanic. Um, we, we did look, I, I get asked this question sometimes, we did look at Native American populations. Um, the sample was just too small to include, um, but they're underdiagnosed as well. So they're being missed. Um, you know, so it, 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 it's a lot, there's a lot of work to do there. Um, and as I mentioned in some previous uh, presentations, I, I do really, uh, I wanna thank Dr. Carbone. He's done incredible work in screening getting kids fast track, getting them in um, and knowing all of our numbers. Uh, I say, if we just looked at University of Utah data, we could get a really good idea of what we were doing here um, because they see a tremendous amount of kids. Um, so, you know, I just can't go on without having to say that. Uh, thank you to them. Um, so, you know, what changes occurred from the last, the 1.7% to the 2.2, um, you know, the legislature passed um, ABA uh, requirements for insurance, uh, trying to get these affordable for families. So, you know, you're no longer getting parents who are saying, don't diagnose my kid with autism. I want this diagnosis and this diagnosis and this diagnosis so they can get treatment. Um, you know, you're, you're looking for an autism diagnosis in some cases, or some cases it's just required to be ABA. Um, so, you know, that's all, all very interesting. Um, but what does that actually mean um, for people with autism? Um, and this is kind of what, you know, like where I like to dig into the numbers. Um, so an individual with autism has 4.6 other diagnoses. Um, you know, I hear the conversation often framed as autism and developmental disabilities, and people are thinking of it as autism and developmental disabilities. They're not thinking them is the same. Um, put a little picture of my nephew, Ty, here. Um, you know, he's got five other diagnoses. Um, and, you know, so you're, you're never, I'm never thinking of Ty as autism and developmental disabilities, I'm always thinking of him as time. And, you know, depending on the day, um, autism might be the absolute last thing you're thinking about. Um, so it's, it's really holistic. And I think we need to think of it in that, that context, you know. Um, looking at the most common other ones, um, ADHD was found at 48%. I remember a very early autism training I did. Um, the, the, the presenter said that it was autism or ADHD. Uh, they weren't co-occurring and he could tell the difference. And, um, you know, as we kind of look through these numbers here, Eric, you're probably laughing, I bet you know who I'm talking about. Um, as we're looking at these numbers, you know, you see these, these do co-occur. Um, depression was found in 20%. Anxiety was found in 45%. I always laugh because I'm like 45%. I mean, it's probably really a hundred. Um, mm -hmm. intellectual disability is at 20 and then seizure disorder is at 10. Um, and then in looking at, um, kind of the most staggering part of this data, um, and a little background for this. So Ann Kirby, um, who's a researcher at the U did a great study on suicidal behavior and autism. And she found that suicide uh, deaths were three times higher in individuals, uh, or were, I'm sorry, much higher in individuals with autism than without, and three times higher in females with autism. Um, so we looked at 16 year olds in this uh, study group and um, looked at suicidal ideation. And we found that 13% of individuals with autism have evidence of suicide ideation. 23% um, of females have evidence of suicide ideation. So that's nearly a quarter. Um, and then 9% of males. 21% um, of individuals um, with autism and intellectual disability have suicide ideation. Um, so 
you know, it's not a protective factor. It's, it's everyone on the spectrum um, could be affected by this. Um, so 55, and to put that another way, 55% of individuals with suicide ideation have autism and intellectual disability. 58% um, have suicide ideation and depression. Um, and then this one's kind of the one that really scares me. 42% um, have suicide ideation and no depression. You know, um, what, what are you seeing? What's your indicator? Um, how are you knowing that this is something that they're feeling? Is this something you're talking to them about? Um, is this something you're able to communicate about? Are you not just talking past each other? So, um, you know, those are all things to really think about um, when we're talking about autism. Um, some studies that URAD has done over the last uh, few years, um, I always like to bring up a, a, a null finding. So. Um, in work with IHC, um, URAD did a longitudinal study to look at whether labor induction and augmentation during childbirth uh, increased the risk of autism, and they found it did not. Um, so this just kind of died; it never, never made it into a paper, <laughs> um, which is a bummer, you know. But yeah, because you know a lot of a lot of folks like to have all kinds of ideas of what causes autism, and uh, this is one of them that's floating around out there. Um, and you know, it's hard to publish something and say, no, we didn't find anything. Um, so I always like to just bring that one up. Uh, suicide and autism, I, I've covered that. And then uh, inflammation during pregnancy. Um, so Dr. Deborah Builder was the, the author of this study and uh, they found that first and second trimester um, uh, risk of inflammation in the first and second trimester was associated with a, a greater risk of autism. And, um, you know, what that's a, a growing part of the literature in looking at in utero uh, and possible causes of autism. But, you know, follow up on that, further studies and all that is very important to, to determine the actual risk factors and the, the causes and how much that plays a role. Um, Kind of a hard shift in topic here. So, and this is uh, also something similar to the medical home portal and I'm very thankful for that. So on our website, we post autism evaluator um, provider lists and ABA lists. So it's just autism and kind of just the, the nuts and bolts. Um, so these are available on the children with special health care need website in a PDF form so that they can be readable on a, a phone. Um, you know, a smartphone or, or something like that. And parents can come and just see, usually it's insurance, you know, this is what's driving this, who takes my insurance? Um, and then where are they located? So they can come in and just see this, this pretty quickly. Um, you know, uh, the, these lists are probably uh, what I get uh, emailed the most about from providers. Um, they're, oh, I wanna be on, change my listing, do this, do that. Um, so it's fun that we have a repertoire now and that people call in and have, have them updated. Um, you know, we update those and post them when available. I've got my hand up. Oh, okay. I can't see you, so go ahead. This is Tina calling. We love, uh, Family Voices loves these. And as um, we were going through the portal earlier, I had a brain... I had that light bulb go off that maybe we should find a way to maybe get some of it because you have, he, Colin really does have like the most recent stuff, anything new pops up and we're getting families that are going, you know, we can't find a provider, but wait, there's this new one on Colin's list. Maybe they have some openings. Um, so it's, it's really useful. I think the other driver on this one for sure is, um, I would say, where can I find a provider even, even more so than where can I find one that takes my insurance because there's so many wait lists right now. But anyway, these are great. And I had a little brainstorm. We should probably talk with Mindy later on how can we like somehow partner on making sure that um, we also have providers this, this up to date that we can get out. Thanks, that's all, sorry. Well, thank you for that. Um...
And this is Eric. I just posted both of those links in the chat. So I have um, the diagnosis and the ABA provider list um, links posted in the chat. Well, uh, thank you all for that. So that is kind of my my quick run through of you know the updated data, um, kind of the key issues as I see them, and. Um, where we're at as a program. Um, I would love to answer any questions or if anybody has any comments or improvements, uh, please, please speak up. I just have a comment. This is Athena again. Um, so the list that um, Colin has on the website, I, all of those listings are currently in the medical home portal as well. Um, I've reviewed it just a couple weeks ago to make sure that our information matched his. But yes, I think a partnership on making sure that we both have the same information would be great. Yeah, it could be something as simple as when I, I get um, a request to update, I could forward that to you all um, so that you get that information as well. Um, and I've been talking with um, Julia Hood, uh, the, the, the great Julia Hood, as I always say, um, she's the one who diagnosed my nephew. Um, and she knows a lot of folks in the community that um, independent providers that do evaluations, um, you know, in other areas of the state that don't have wait lists. Um, and, you know, kind of depending on the, the kiddo, if it, something that's easy, that doesn't need like a, a full, full workup, she could get them in there um, or, information listed so so that's a, a possibility as well Colin who is Julia Hood with um well she's with the University of Utah now but um you know her uh, evaluation services are through private practice That's wonderful. And I'll just point out that we know that what Colin is doing that is hard harder for us um, with the medical home portals service directory is uh, providing that additional insurance information, which is a moving target, of course. Um, and we know how important that is for families and we really appreciate the time and effort that Colin puts into that. Uh, so that's a that's a real plug for for those spreadsheets and those PDFs from Colin and and we appreciate that. Um, Tina's point uh, also well taken that uh, for some families that becomes less of the issue than the timing of everything, right? But um, uh, yeah, we 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 have Colin on here because we think he's amazing and we love the work that's being done over there and and want to make sure everyone knows uh, about all of the options and opportunities to help improve outcomes for these kids. Um, so I know that Colin would be happy to uh, answer any questions if you want to follow up with him later. Um, we'll make sure that you have his uh, information in the uh, chat and also in the summary of the meeting. But as always, Colin, thank you for everything that you're doing. I know it's a passion of yours. Um, you've been doing this for a long time and the families of Utah um, are better off because of it. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, you know, I, a shout out to the Medical Home Portal. I'm using some information from your autism page and my health status update, which is wonderful. So thank you. Um, and, and you know, just to go back to um, the suicidal ideation, depression, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I don't want that to get lost. The, um, people with autism bring such a richness to our lives, and um, you know, like like I mentioned, it's personal for me. I have a family member who's you know my best pal, and I, I think we have the same sense of humor. He's eleven, so that, that kind of leads you to about my sense of humor. Um, but it's just. Make them part of your community. Say hello. Um, you know, love those folks in your life, and maybe everyone can make just a little bit of difference as a person, and that might make a big difference as a community. Thank you all again. Thanks, Colin, and best wishes with your next presentation. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Okay, well, I think we can um, switch over now to Dr. Carbone. Um, do you wanna share your screen?
Sure. Okay. Fantastic. I think hopefully you should have the ability to. Okay. And as I do that, I just want to um, thank uh, Colin um, for just all the work that you do personally and, and through autism systems development, as well as Eric at, at Integrated Services. Um, you know, Title V is so important um, to all of us in terms of being that glue and that providing those connections and <clears throat> support for um, you know, children with special health care needs in general, but obviously for kids with autism as well. And you do a great job. And I think what has been fun about joining this meeting is like just, you know, I, 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 I don't get to join it that often, but it's, it's just a, a bunch of cool partnerships. And I, it really feels neat like that as a community, we're all kind of in the boat together and we're all rowing together right now. And that sounds a little trite to say, but I've been around long enough to know that sometimes we were, you know, going our disparate ways. So it's, it's, it feels like it's, um, we got a, little, a lot of good mojo right now. So it's good, it's good, to, good to see you all. Um, I was asked briefly to, when should I stop blathering, by the way? Uh, go ahead and blather until 9.45 if you'd 945. like. 9.45, okay. And I can be done be way before that. Um, I was asked to, I think, give a, a quick sort of preview around Autism 101. At least I think that's what I was asked to do. So I hope I'm <laughs> talking about the right thing. But uh, this is something that's been uh, fun to do. It's part of our Aspire um, program. Um, Aspire stands for Autism Services Personalized Integrated um, Research Informed and Empowering. I always have to kind of think about that. Aspire. And um, it's a part of an initiative that we've had at the University of Utah through the Child Development Program for about two to three years now. And it's this sort of notion that in a lot of places, people wait to get autism services like diagnostic workups, et cetera, at some sort of you know, diagnostic center. And it's just been assumed that the waits to get into a diagnostic center are horrendously long, and but there's nowhere else that you can get them. And this is just the way we've all accepted things to be for a long time. And with the, with the help of uh, our uh, department chair, Dr. Giardino, we've kind of tried to make some effort to kind of break down that notion and say that autism services um, can be, should be, should be available in every community um, with the support maybe of that diagnostic center. And so we're trying to distribute the care of people with autism out into all corners of Utah um, by empowering primary care providers and other frontline providers to learn as much about autism as they can so that like Colin says, like you can just, you know, be there for that patient rather than saying, well, there's nothing we can do and you wait to see these, these people up there. So this is one of those initiatives. There's many that we're doing these days, but this was sort of one of those ones where we want to blanket the state. Um, if you desire to get um, some information about how to care for people with autism, this we're hoping this echo will just be kind of ongoing and rolling all the time. We're, we're starting it this year. Um, and we're thankful for the folks at Project Echo and Mindy's team and everybody for giving us the opportunity. But this is um, all of our team members who kind of, we meet every week, uh, we meet in about an hour and uh, we talk about all of our initiatives and it's a very collaborative process in um, making decisions. And uh, um, I think some of our team members are here. I think I saw Gabby and Amalia, they are invaluable to sort of the organizational efforts that we do. Um, um, Allison Elsie is our new developmental pediatrician. Ashley and, and Michelle are um, spectacular psychologists who have lots of expertise in autism. And uh, Colleen offers that really neat parent and advocacy perspective. And um, so we're, we're a big team. And um, let's see. So the, I think I heard when I jumped on, somebody had already talked a ton about Project Echo. So I won't go into it, but it's a neat platform. Um, this is where people would access all of their offerings. Um, it is sort of a HIPAA compliant, you know, learning collaborative. That's what Echoes sort of are. And it uses video conferencing technology. And it's a way for all of us just to come together as providers um, 
to improve the, the health outcomes of, of the patients that we serve in this case. Autism, um, it doesn't cost anything. So providers can go to the website, register, and off you go, you get some free CME. And how cool is that? And then um, this is our sort of educational objective. We're just going to focus on the unique needs of children with autism and lots of the um, faculty that work at CDP, Child Development Program, will help out. We may even get some um, fun guest hosts here and there who have um, expertise in other areas to join us. This is the tentative uh, schedule that we have. This is really meant to be kind of a learn the basics sort of echo. So we're going to really uh, touch upon you know, common uh, issues that come up in the lives of people with autism across the lifespan. So we'll start off with early signs and then uh, march into some of the surveillance and screening efforts that are done in primary care. And then uh, kind of what happens during the diagnostic evaluation. Um, we'll probably highlight what we do at UDAC um, in terms of multidisciplinary evaluations. And then um, delve into some of the behavioral uh, developmental educational interventions. And then um, over summer, we'll hit some of those really important uh, co-occurring conditions that Colin was talking about um, that we've talked about a lot here, sleep, um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation, all of that really important stuff that you're right on some days, the, it is, these are way more important than the autism itself. So this is a lot of providers really wanna know about these things. We'll spend some time there obviously talking about community and family supports, and we've talked a lot about that today. Um, some, some issues around growing up and transitioning, and then um, creating an autism-friendly practice, what, what providers can do within their own practices to make the practice more welcoming for people with autism and their families. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. And then um, we're also working and I wanted you all just to know about some of this stuff. This is since I have a little extra time, I can, I can never um, uh, stop talking about one thing. So we have a advanced autism echo starting this year, and that will probably start in the summertime if things go well. Um, I was remiss at the beginning of all this that all of the support uh, to do all these things, at least for the last two years, has come from the Intermountain Foundation. So we're very appreciative of their uh, support of what we do. Um, this advanced echo is kind of what it sounds like. It's for providers who want to get to that next level. So they already have that basic knowledge of caring for people with autism. And again, we're in the planning st stages. We've had some focus groups with prospective providers who want to do this. I have in my mind this map of Utah where we have advanced autism echo providers kind of all over the state. So you can access somebody with this advanced um, training kind of where you live. Um, we have nine providers thus far, and they've all gotten adjunct status at the university so they can have really deep access to our clinic and to our resources. Um, this is going to be a pretty close expanded partnership with CDP. Um, and what we're kind of building for, at least the sort of headline item in this, is that could a provider in primary care practice um, in Tremonton who's in our program diagnose autism? And I think the answer is yes, but it's gonna take some extra training. And so we're working with these folks now to figure out like, how often could you meet? What would your practice process have to change to accommodate this? What kind of tools would you need? All that cool stuff. But we're hoping to have these providers and again, provide this training ongoing so we can expand that, um, the ability for providers around the state to diagnose autism. And then, um, because I definitely want to keep talking about things that I totally care about in the little, you give me a couple of minutes, I'm going to take it all. So um, this is something that we've worked on with a bunch of, of, of you all, um, the Autism Council, uh, Colin and Eric at the Department of Health and um, Salt Lake Adaptive Rec, who are just amazing people um, in the home program is we're starting a, uh, what we're calling a walk and roll club. So this is just like basically a walking club um, one of my sort of passions is adaptive recreation. Um, people with autism and developmental disabilities in general just don't have the opportunities to be physically active, and that 
helps like your physical and mental health. So um, to lower that sort of bar of access, the, these are gonna happen every week. It's a walking club, we have volunteers. So people get paired up with a volunteer, kind of like you fit and you'll make a buddy and you'll walk every week for an hour um, with your buddy. And um, during the cool winter months, these will take place in rec centers, but during the warmer wet weather months, they'll take place in regional parks. This will be in six week sessions. So it's once a week for six weeks, we'll take a week off and then we'll start the next section. So it happens year round. This isn't a program that we go on one walk and we say we're good. This is gonna be like 40 walks a year. And hopefully this, this um, creates the opportunity to develop some healthy habits, create friendships, work on your social skills, kind of all kinds of cool things. Um, and uh, so much, many thanks to like the Department of Health and the Autism Council who have sort of supported this. Um, we're gonna have like free t-shirts for all the kids. We have a logo. Uh, which is here. We have like water bottles with the logo, stickers for the kids. It's going to be sort of, we're going to try to motivate them to keep going. So that's through Salt Lake Adaptive and, you, you know, parents can go to the, their website and register and hopefully we'll all have some fun with that. And then I'll uh, end by talking about Spark because I can't go anywhere without talking about Spark. So hopefully you all know about Spark and you're uh, um, talking to providers about it and you're sending patients directly to the website. But Spark is a big uh, research study. It's the largest autism research study in the world. Over 250,000 people have registered um, with Spark. It's an amazingly large st uh, study. And um, it's been really fun for us to be a part of it. We're one of the uh, clinical sites across the country at the University of Utah. Um, it's a study that's essentially done entirely online. So you can tell families you don't have to go anywhere. It's a good COVID thing to do. You just sit in your house and sit on your computer like half the people are doing uh, with half their time anyways. And it involves um, a saliva collection. So I tell people it's sort of like ancestry.com or one of those things where you, you get a like a little shoebox thing, you spit in a tube, seal it up and send it back off. And that's, that's used to collect a DNA sample. Um, and then that DNA sample is used to um, help researchers find uh, new genes that are associated with autism and all kinds of other cool things. Um, $50 in amazon.com gift cards for families who return this. It's entirely free to participate. You never have to pay anything to be in Spark. Our center is the, um, I think for this year, we were either the highest or the second highest recruiting site. And that's thanks to the great team that we have. So 6,000 uh, folks have, per, have registered through in Spark through our site. This is our website, sparkforautism.org. Um, you can always contact us. And Spark is now five years old. So it's, a, it's, it's the research study. I tell people this is not a one-off. Spark will, will continue to ex exist for a long, 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 long time. It's a longitudinal study and it's trying to answer lots of other questions besides just what genes cause autism. So um, 250,000 people, that lots of DNA has been sequenced. Um, people get reports back from Spark. There's webinars all the time. So somebody has done a, a webinar, I think recently on depression and autism and talked about um, suicide risk, et cetera. So all kinds of great content for participants. So participants get a, an invitation to watch a webinar about something that's meaningful to them. So this is very participatory. Families get a lot back uh, from Spark and lots of papers published. Um, it's not just like this is a new gene, but through something called research match, um, these are oftentimes survey-based studies where families are asked um, to complete a survey about whatever research topic that the researchers in the network wanna look at. Right now there's a series of papers on how COVID-19 is affecting um, families of children with autism and those are survey surveys that are then published. So lots of other really cool research happening in Spark. Um, and I tell people it's like really four easy steps. You just create an, an account, invite some family members, you spit in this tube and off you go. Um, so with that, I think I met my time with even five minutes to spare. So if there's anybody that has any questions or comments uh, about any of the junk that I just talked about, and I just want to 
I thank everybody for having me and it's really fun to see all you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Carbone. All that is amazing. You got a lot of um, brains turning with the walk and roll and- uh, Good. Yeah, and every time I hear about Spark, I'm like, oh, I know somebody else I should tell uh, about that. I need to be reminded regularly about that because- Yes, um, you, are, you, are we, all, you are all deputized, please do. Very, very nice. Um, so Tina has um, asked about Spark having um, spit swabs in stock for kids who can't spit enough. We do. Amalia is here with me and she's nodding her head as well. And I think if I could see Gabby, she would be nodding her head as well. Um, these are kind of specialized kits. Sometimes we find uh, that parents have a hard time collecting saliva in the traditional way. So um, they do have these specialized swabs that soak up saliva a little bit more that can be put in. And Amalia, do you have anything to add up on that? We have to ask for them you know, um, from Spark Central, we call it, but I think we have kits and it's usually not too long to wait. Yeah, sometimes you just, um, when, our research coordinator Allie will call. Sometimes she calls and follows up. You'll just want to let her know um, that you know, hey, my child has a hard time spitting, and then we just request to have one of them sent. It's just it's sponges, and then they just kind of wring those out, and that's it goes and it's sent off. So yeah, at, it might at our meeting, it, but not much. Yeah, at our meeting today, Amalia, let's um, talk to Allie to get in touch with Tina um, to get that spark that um, swab because I had mentioned it um, a little while before, but but we were out of them. So um, I will yeah, mention that. Because we're not going to complete our family kit until we can get him swabbed because I talked with someone and they said it doesn't make sense to not have him done. Um, but we're excited. Yeah. To, yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, um, Tina. Spark is nationwide. It's not specific to those living in Utah. We're one of 31 clinical sites um, across the country. So this is, these are autism, usually mostly um, university-based autism centers across the country, but this is a massive um, countrywide study. Spark is nationwide, I agree. Um, yep, and there's an email address if anybody needs it. Anything else about, I see Laurel here today and she was very instrumental in our uh, walk and roll effort. So many thanks. Oh, that is fantastic. I'm super excited about that. Um, Tina, or sorry, Gwen um, wonders, uh, I know I already have access to uh, Colin's slides and um, I can probably download those as a PDF and, and then make a link to them. Um, uh, would we be able to get a copy of your slides to sure. Dr. Carbone? Yeah, should I just email them directly to you? That'd be great. I'll do that That'd be right great. now. And typically what we do guys is we'll, we'll just uh, make those a, a static link um, and then uh, link to those from the summary that we'll send out um, by Friday. Uh, and if you need it sooner, we can send it to you directly. Okay, awesome, very, very cool. Everybody's really buzzing, this is great. Um, Amalia, what else do you wanna talk with us about? And would you like me to pull up your slides or do you wanna screen share? No screen share? Screen share, yeah. Okay, I, I think a it. lot of what I am about to say is the exact same as what Paul just said. Oh man, did I mess <laughs> oh, no. all that up? Amalia? No, you're fine. I appreciate it because then it takes away a lot of the pressure from me. So this is perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dang. I'm not mad at all. Amazing coordination that happened between <laughs> Molly and I apparently today. Oh yeah, the five-year kid, this is great. Yeah, I was just going to do a brief five-year report. And so it's, it's good that you're here too. So you can chime in if needed, Paul. Um, real quickly. So as, as Paul was saying, SPARK just hit five years and it is a simple study that can be done from the patient's or the participant's home. So they have the potential to earn $50 in Amazon gift cards. And there's a little QR code there. So you'll have access to these slides if you want to share this QR code. So it's easy for you to um, kind of send out to people. The PI is Dr. Carbone. So you just heard from him. He's passionate about the research. So it's really great to have a PI who is so involved. I think that's why uh, part of the reason why we're so successful with recruitment. Um, just a, a little brief overview. Uh, our site has had about 5,000 individuals registered for Spark. Um, so it is nationwide. And we are one of the top sites, which is great. Um, you can see it's 
The goal is to build the largest long-term research cohort for understanding of autism and to just help improve the lives of people with autism. And so as, as Paul was explaining, there's that research map. So they fill out questionnaires after completing their online um, registration. So it just helps create better understanding of, of individuals with autism. And you'll have access to these slides. It just helps give you a, a bigger understanding of SPARC and why it's, it's such an amazing study. So you can see here, 275,000 participants in SPARC over the last five years, um, 106,000 individuals with autism, including 16,000 um, adults. So it's not just for children, it's for adults as well. 26,000 females, 80,000 males. So this is just a really nice breakdown of who the people are that are participating. Um, and then it, there is a little brief um, snippet there about that research map. So just really helps with uh, the autism fit and everything else. So there's been over 100 genes that have been linked to autism through SPARC, um, and they have built the largest data resource right now um, in the world for individuals with autism. So it's one of the largest studies ever conducted for, for people with autism. So that's about the feel I had. Luckily, Paul kind of walked us into that. Does anybody have any questions for me that I can help with? It seems like um, I got some from Tina. Anything else from anyone? I'll just, think about it. I'll just throw this out. Uh, so I know with the Ancestry.com and 23andMe kinds of things, there's been some controversy over what happens with your data. Um, with the Spark data, that's not going to be used in any other way than just for the, the Spark and autism information, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and they do ask you um, when you sign up for the study if, they, if you want to use any of that for, I think, other studies, correct, Paul? Correct me if I'm wrong, but you have the yeah, opportunity I mean, to you, let them use it for other... It, it's first, it's, it's de-identified. So each participant get, gets a global unique identifier ID. So it's a GUID and you... Um, so I tell parents that basically to the researchers, you're X52736-A, that's it. And uh, so nobody gets, um, none of the researchers gets your ID. That's all separate. And then um, families decide what they want to know. What's done is a whole exome sequencing um, test. So that's, they're gonna sequence all the DNA that codes for proteins. That's supposedly kind of where the action is in terms of autism risk genes. And all they're doing is looking for genes that are confidently associated with autism. That's the only thing that they're going to report back to families. And that's if families check the box and say, I wanna know that. There are a list of sort of common conditions that families can opt into as well that, mm -hmm. you know, if you have this, and this is a widely accepted like Huntington's Korea, you know, there's like yeah. five or six of them and you can opt in or opt out to any of that. The information can be shared with a doctor, opt in, opt out. So all of this, the family decides what they wanna share with whom and when. Um, yeah. If, and Go ahead. I will. Yeah, this is Heidi and uh, my son and I did it. And um, it is it, it is very it is very private. And you have to actually if it, it'll actually say, do you want to be notified if you have any, um, you know, if you're predetermined to have this and you you have to physically mark yes to be notified. They don't just randomly do it. So, yeah, just be just know that it is very. Um, very private and um, Spark has really done a good job of, you know, just keeping things, keeping you separate from your name and your your genes. So it it's very safe. Wonderful, thank you. I think, I think the future is here guys. Like this idea of a whole exome, I mean, like my mind is getting blown right now. Wow. Um, Super, super cool. So we just want to, um, I know that uh, Amalia can get you physical flyers if that's helpful to you. Um, if the QR code isn't the way uh, you want to work with uh, the families that, that you're seeing, um, but there's lots of options to get them information clearly.
Um, really amazing. And then I just want to circle back um, for a moment to something that Colin said. So, you know, all these studies are kind of telling us what um, what the causes may be for autism, what some of the causes may be for autism, um, and certainly knowledge is power always. Um, we're, we're also learning that there are some, you know, very concerning things that um, correlate with autism that we need to be aware of. What, if anything, Colin and, and Paul and Amalia, is being done to help us recognize that autism is is here and we need to embrace it and and there are many of us who need to change ourselves not try and change what's happening for that individual and is there you know what what can we do beyond just saying there's going to be so much more richness in our lives if we recognize that we need to um to 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 join this instead of being resistant or concerned or whatever um just just throwing that out there Paul, do you want to? You want to start? Or you want me to? You you go first on that one. Sure. Well, I mean, I think that there's. Um, I, I think in the autism community, it's important to. I, I try to point out to folks that there's a very um, vocal subpopulation of the of the autism community who are self advocates, and I think this has been something rather new that sometimes people like in in the medical profession we we sometimes aren't, aren't aware of, but there are lots of folks with autism who are sort of beating that drum like, hey, I, 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 autism is a disability, but there's nothing wrong with me. I just need acceptance, inclusion, and supports. And I think that that's what, you know, I think Colin said it better than anybody here, just like make a friend, you know, be, 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 be accepting, um, be accommodating. And I think we're all like in this advocacy boat together. We're trying, I think one of the things that it's so important about what Colin's group does through URAD is they're telling that story of how, how prevalent autism is. And at this point, it's like 2% of the population is like, you're going to run into somebody with autism every day. And so it's not just something that you go over here to deal with. It's like, we all have, um, a responsibility to accept those who have differences and, and a neurodiverse society benefits all of us. So um, one of the things that I was totally like loved, and then I'll get out of the way for Colin is, um, I'll put this in the chat to everybody. Um, I was lucky enough to be on this Lancet Commission websites right there. And um, this is a free download. There's 78 million people with autism in the world. And I, I was lucky enough to hang out on four separate occasions with these autism experts across the world. And we were able to write a commission paper for The Lancet, which is really fun. It's like an entire issue of the journal. And so you can all curl up with 78 pages of, of what we can do to help people with autism right now. So that's, I think, the problem that we're seeing is a lot of the research is sort of looking for causes, looking for sort of things that are 20 years out, which is really important work. But <clears throat> this paper sort of tackles like, what about the 95% of people with autism throughout the world who get no services? Because that's really the way autism is. Like we would talk about the need for ABA in the United States and, you know, the people in India would stand up and go, oh, we don't even know what that is. Like, there's no services like that in India. So what are the things that we can all do as a, as a world to support people with autism? So hopefully you get a chance to look at, look at that. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, we'll make sure that link goes out in the, in the summary of the meeting. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I was, was looking for. And Colin, please go ahead and jump in if you have anything. I think uh, Paul, Paul said all that perfectly. Um... You know, he touched on the areas that I'm always afraid to touch on uh, there. Um, but, you know, I think you guys are, are doing wonderful work with the care coordination. Um, and I, that's incredible. That is something that people didn't have um, five years ago. <laughs> um, so, you know, that that does help. Um, and Spark is, is awesome. Um, I love that stuff, um, you know. There's, there's a, a bunch of uh, different groups looking at causes and you know what, they might all be right. Um, you know, um, yeah, so keep up the great work. Awesome, okay. And you know, one of the things that maybe I could leave you with two seconds. Yeah. Um, 
in the, in the commission, you, you, you all might have heard about this. The, we on the commissioner are on some levels getting a little bit beat up over this and that's fine. Like that's what we've all done that as leaders and as advocates before. Sometimes you kind of take a little heat, but to your point, Mindy, about helping, there was also a very group, uh, a very vocal group of caregivers who said, you know, autism has become sort of popularized in the media as something that sometimes it's not. And people tell me all the time to look at this Netflix uh, thing on, I, I, I don't watch too much about autism on TV because I, I get enough of it at home and in clinic, but, um, but there is something that a, a, a a large group of people with autism have that we called in the commission and we called for this as an administrative term called profound autism. And that is where somebody requires 24 seven support for their care and their safety, oftentimes associated with intellectual disability and very significant co-occurring you know, co conditions. And we, we called for that term to be used because people with profound autism are not getting the services that they need. And these are folks that have kind of farther to fall in terms of if their needs aren't met. Um, and I know we talked about that today around waivers and things of that sort, but that's just something to, to read about in the commission paper as well. Okay, that's, that's uh, yeah, so important. All right, so to point out that Amalia and Laurel also posted in the chat um, that Spark is, is not necessarily about curing autism, it is to understand autism better. And it's important that as you're working with these families that you pass that information along yeah. um, so that they get that this is to support them, to support them. And Laurel says for adults with autism spectrum disorder, finding a workplace that is willing to make reasonable accommodations is the big challenge. So that's another thing that we could all do in our day-to-day -day lives is, is just continue to um, make it known that our, our lives are richer when we um, choose to be inclusive and everyone benefits, everyone benefits. Guys, yep. can I have one minute? <clears throat> one minute. <laughs> So really quick, got a 22 year old that is in that category, uh, very much so, and completely nonverbal and just very different, doesn't cry, doesn't show his emotions the same as other people. And um, we've had some fun lately trying to get blood tests. And I really am trying to move to that adult world um, with Adam, but uh, the way it ended up working out is we could not, we, we attempted and failed. And my husband and I walked out really bummed uh, from an EKG and blood draws in the adult clinic world and ended up after all going to primaries and having them done. And they did um, know how to handle him a little more. So just kind of a thought there. It is definitely an issue we have. And as far as I know now, the only place I can take him is primaries that really doesn't look at him like he's an alien. Take medication. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Just this is your feel good moment to leave on today is uh, to Laurel's point about um, uh, employment. And this is just one place, but th think about if all of our organizations could do, be that one place, how it would add up. So, there was this, I had. I had tried to get somebody with autism hired in our clinic for a long time and for you know a bunch of red tape reasons like it just you know we've probably all looked in these things before and you go yeah it's whatever it, it gets passed over. And Dr. Giardino has a suggestion box for all of us in the Department of Pediatrics. So I put it in the suggestion box that we should hire somebody with autism at our autism clinic. Like here's an idea. And he got back to me like 2 days later and said, "Yeah, let's do that." So we hired a self-advocate who is working in our clinic and it's probably the most like feel good thing. And this person is like an amazing part of our team. I got chills. Yep. Me too. Ah. I can't talk about it without like practically tearing up. Yep. Right there with you. Okay. I knew this was going to be a great meeting. This was a great meeting. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we meet again in 
pretty much exactly a month. March 16th is our next meeting. And I just want to remind you, we have the listserv. You can use it anytime. You don't have to wait until we meet. If you run into a question, you want to share something, any of that, all of that, and we'll make sure you have that, that email address for the listserv in the summary. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Amalia. And you guys go out and have a, a wonderful um, autism advocate day and rest of your week. Okay, bye.